Hello, everyone. We'll just wait a few seconds or maybe a minute until everybody joins. I can see that the numbers are going up, so we might have more people joining. So thank you all for taking the time to attend. Thank you. A very warm welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to a new session and a new topic where today we will be discussing uh, financial technology and the future of financial services. My name is Hiba Abbasi, and on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center team, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, today, I'm very extremely delighted to be joined by our guest speakers. Uh, our first guest speaker is Professor Marcus Zachariadis. Professor Marcus holds the Greensill Chair of Financial Technology, FinTech, and is full professor of information systems at Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. He is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Financial and Mon Monetary Systems and a FinTech Research Fellow at Cambridge Center for Digital Innovation, University of Cambridge. Our next speaker is senior alumni, Mohamed Rijdi, who holds an MBA from Alliance Manchester Business School, the University of Manchester. He is a Chief Information Officer, Chief Digital Officer, FinTech and Digital Transformation Advisor. Mohammed has more than 25 years of experience in technology, 12 years out of which acting as a Chief Information Officer and a Chief Operating Officer in the financial services industry, the conventional and Islamic. He had the distinction of being an executive team member in establishing four Islamic finance startups in the MENA region. In addition to this, he has led the IT teams on the first ever transformation of conventional bank into an Islamic bank in 2001. And last but not least, our final speaker for today and moderator for the session, Dr. Amin al Khouli, who is the managing director at Apex Group in uh, ADGM or Abu Dhabi Global Markets. Amin holds a Master of Engineering degree in Software Engineering and a PhD in Artificial Intelligence from Imperial College London and an MBA from Alliance Manchester Business School. Since 2017, Amin has been a consultant to regional and international firms. He is involved in executive training and coaching and is an adjunct faculty at Alliance Manchester Business School and other universities. He is actively involved in promoting FinTech through startup mentoring, angel investing, and public speaking. Marcus, Amin, and Mohammed, it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. And um, Marcus, I'm gonna give it to you now to uh, start the piece. Maybe we can uh, tell the audience about the piece that you wrote to the World Economic Forum. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly mention that. Thanks a lot, Hiba, for the introduction. Uh, let me just see how I can share my screen, because I know I did that before, but now. Yes, you go to the sharing button. Symbolism. Yes, uh, and I have then to choose what I want to share. So, can you see my screen now? Yeah, okay. Yes. Excellent. Uh, and I think it's not in full screen. You can see this side slides as well. Yep. It's not in full. Okay, I think I'll have to do that and then should correct now. So it's not, it says paused for some reason. About to. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's good enough actually. So I'm trying to make this smaller. Uh, yeah, it's really excellent. Well, yeah, it's. Okay, no, it's great. It's fine. Uh, it's big enough, uh, I hope. Uh, so, hello, everybody, and and thanks for having me on this webinar. It's it's a great pleasure to be here to present some of the work 
um, I've been doing uh, as part of my role at Alliance Manchester Business School um, and also uh, some of the greater involvement I have in the fintech industry, including the World Economic Forum that was just mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just a brief introduction about what is my role at, at AMBS and, and what I do in the greater context within the uh, industry of fintech. As Hiba said, I'm a, a full professor and chair. Uh, at Alliance Manchester Business School, uh, where I hold the Green Seal Chair. So it's a name chair after a, a massive donation we got from um, one of the fintech unicorns in the UK, which is called Green Seal, Green Seal Capital. And Lex Green Seal was a graduate of uh, uh, University of Manchester as well. So he also did the MBA at Alliance Manchester Business School. And then he uh, he built a very successful business as Green Seal Capital basically is active in, in salary finance and trade finance. So they're using heavily artificial intelligence to be able to assess risk in a better way using different kinds of data as well and uh, and supply businesses who need access to liquidity in order to be able to trade. And recently they expanded into uh, um, salary finance opportunities and and also in, in, in respect to COVID they've been helping quite a few people get access to cash earlier. Um, so we're really grateful to be able to have this partnership and acquire this donation from Rent Seal Capital. And on the back of that, where basically my role is to build uh, a fintech center and uh, populate further the fintech research agenda, but also teaching agenda, which I'm also happy to talk uh, a little bit towards the end as well, where our plans are, uh, and be able to put obviously Invest in Manchester on the map as one of the uh, biggest business schools in the UK that is very actively involved, both in terms of teaching and research within the fintech space. So it's been a privilege and a great pleasure to be able to do that at the University of Manchester. Um, now, beyond that, I'm also, as Hiba said, I'm also part of the World Economic Forum. So I sit on the Council, the Global Future Council of Financial and Monetary Systems. Uh, so for those of you who are not really familiar what the Global Future Councils are, they're basically think tanks as part of the great, greater kind of World Economic Forum uh, discussion and agenda uh, of, of uh, world leaders um, within different kinds of spaces. So the, the Financial and Monetary Systems Council is basically really active uh, on the domain uh, within financial services that also um, looks at the involvement and impact of technology in that space. So, um, you know, other people in the council, for example, are, are chief executives or global presidents and and uh, chief advisors to uh, to boards, to global boards of directors and, and central banks and so on and so forth. So it's, it's also a very great opportunity to be part of this vibrant community at the WEF and the discussion moving forward, the uh, the future finance, you know, the agenda with, um, you know, people who are, who are actually decision makers. Um, and my last affiliation is obviously the University of Cambridge. I worked there in the past. So uh, it was the first job out of my PhD that I did at the LSE. Uh, and I have stayed on as a, as a FinTech Research Fellow and, and helping with uh, obviously the research and the conversation within academia. So it's really important as academia, as you, you probably know already, is a very collaborative industry as well. Now, in terms of research, uh, I have been doing research on the role of uh, uh, technology in financial services for basically my entire academic life. So I've done nothing else beyond that. I did my PhD at the LSC looking at the economics of this innovation in finance and payment infrastructures and authored papers uh, with, uh, um, you know, economists, uh, you know, on the impact, economic impact of uh, the, this innovation kind of adoption on, on bank performance, for example. One particular paper we published a couple of years ago, recent policy around the top journals uh, with uh, professors from uh, the LSE, but also economists from MIT. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, obviously looking at technology strategy and, you know, uh, economic implications, but also how to strategize uh, around technology within the financial services sector. So I have done multiple projects in research with both the industry, but also within academia and published on that space. Um, so recent uh, book that you may have seen going around is the Paytech book, which I helped coded with people from the industry um, and and also uh, they, they, there's a lot of chapters and work from academics um, and, and practitioners as well. 
um, and other pieces. Uh, recently wrote a report for HSBC, for example, on the future banking, and of course the work we're doing at the World Economic Forum. I'm going to be talking about a little bit now as part of the, pres the short presentation on digital and what it means to have um, a more meaningful kind of blend between technology and your physical assets as a financial institution, as a bank, and how you can strategize around that going forward, especially uh, after COVID in what we coined as the, well, we didn't coin it, I mean, a lot of people using these terms. So what we call in the, in the short article, the isolation economy. Right, so people are going to be more picky about what they do in in the um, in the physical world, and and so it kind of makes a lot of sense to think of the synergies between technology solutions and digital channels and uh, physical channels that we have. Um, lots of other projects. Obviously, I don't have time, and that's not the point of the of the short um, presentation to go through all of them. I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the findings we've seen in some of the research projects we've done. Uh, which kind of relate to over the overall discussion around how uh, the, the future financial services will be shaped in terms of technology, but also will be accelerated in terms of uh, coronavirus effects. Uh, one of the things we have seen uh, recently, and you probably, I'm, I'm sure if you're following uh, global kind of regulatory frameworks around data sharing and financial services, for example, and the popularity of fintech, uh, is what we call the unbundling of the bank, right? Uh, through new regulations, but also fintech competitions, we have seen that there is an abundance of services and abundance of solutions being offered by different fintech organizations right now. And it's because of new regulations, we have like open APIs uh, and, and data sharing models like open banking in the UK and PSD2 across Europe, that we have seen the emergence and we have experienced that a lot doing our research uh, with colleagues from the University of Oxford and other places that I'm co-authoring right now. Um, uh, and, and business models like, for example, platform-based business models that will move and and um, and allow or for, or even force banks to, to a certain degree to rethink their value chains and rethink the way they're actually making money. So if you coin kind of a business model as as uh, as the as the um, kind of foundational way to organize your economic activity and push out some outputs, you need to kind of rethink, um, you know, how you do that in the context of both competition, but also new regulations. So open banking uh, in, in the broader sense and without really going, you know, very deep into definitions will, uh, will kind of uh, give us the emergence of new platform-based business models within finance services and within banking in particular. And the effect on that will be basically that we'll, we'll see also the rebundling of finance services, right? So from the disintegration into platform into integration again, but in a different kind of format. Um, and in that environment, in that context, we'll see that customers uh, will have much more control over their personal data and also technology and the use of these data by platforms, be it from uh, particular banking institutions or incumbent banks that we already know, or fintech channels of banks or fintech platforms, or even big tech companies, will use this data to basically offer services, develop more personalized services, or what we call hyper-personalization and automation. Right? So that's going to be kind of like almost the, the second wave uh, within this um, uh, um, kind of fintech uh, fin or financial data revolution that we're seeing. Now that as a consequence, as I already mentioned, you know, we'll have uh, that the banks will be uh, or, or will start to think outside how they uh, broker money to how they broker data. So that's kind of one of the main themes that we have highlighted in, in, in our, in our um, papers and publications looking at the economics of, um, you know, economics of fintech, but also economics of data within finance services. Now, the role could, could uh, become, of course, within the, con the context of trust, uh, you know, in, trust of, in, in terms of uh, being trusted brokers of money, right, and value, they can become trusted brokers of, uh, of data and people's identity. So we see that as an emerging role uh, of, of existing financial institutions, but also emerging role of, of even newer, newer financial institutions that are entering into this space right now. Uh, and this is something that we've articulated in, in several papers and publications, which uh, I will, I'll try, I think I have a slide towards the end, with uh, you know a, a few a few things that you can uh, kind of read on after we we break up from this webinar. Now, what is the um, the the uh, effect that all these developments will have in the industry overall? 
uh, these economic theories, but also in terms of organizing economic activity overall uh, in, the, in the context of organizational, um, um, in the context of the organization, the business models, for example, that uh, we'll, we'll see more modularity. And what we mean by modularity is moving away, not just moving away from traditional business models like pipeline business models we see, which is basically um, further vertical integration within uh, institutions. Um, but, but we'll see a more kind of modular architecture, which will mean that uh, to consume an end product or a particular output as a user or consumer, you'll have to go through a number of uh, institutions, not anymore uh, one particular company or one particular kind of bank perhaps that has all these uh, you know, several uh, elements of the of the value chain kind of integrated and all these components integrated uh, um, in within one particular organization. So we will see kind of much more modularity and uh, um, and distributed uh, kind of uh, value value chains within financial services. So that's one of the another kind of important finding, at least for us, you know, looking at the literature within. Um, how economic activity is being organized uh, in, in the broader sense. Um, a couple of other uh, things that we have seen, um, of course, you know, a lot of people are talking these days about the future of money and how uh, even data will, will really transform the way we exchange uh, valuable assets, be it money or commodity or any kind. And in, you know, considering what I've talked so far, that could even be data in, in, in this day and age. Um, we have seen more uh, of, uh, um, you know, of, of these developments within the traditional kind of uh, value transfer or, or uh, payment business uh, towards also there a more distributed kind of architecture. So CBDCs are probably the latest developments you're all kind of aware, were aware of these days where blockchain and other um, distributed technologies or distributed ledger uh, based technologies can be used to basically provide a more kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, architecture for the move and, and communication of, of value. Right, um, and this has been a development that was really, um, a, you know, really took off the last couple of years. Uh, I think one of the first movers has been the central bank in China that has been discussing this, but a lot more other banks have jumped onto this uh, uh, kind of a CBDC train and already have. Uh, uh, con you know, broader consultations and do a lot of research. Bank of Canada, for example, recently back of England had a few white papers recently, but uh, also a few years back uh, exploring this. I know uh, Central Bank of France have, have launched, um, um, you know, not exactly a consultation, but a call for, for um, you know, companies to come in and exploit or a kind of experiment on this space as well. And, and we feel confident that we'll see a lot more on that. Now, what are the economic implications of CBDC payment infrastructures? Uh, that's a very big question. So again, there's a lot of work going into that, both from central banks. We're actually starting a new project now, or trying to start a new project on the economic implications of CBDC, specifically looking at wholesale um, payment space, but certainly it's going to be a very interesting kind of space uh, to think about. Um, I think I've already, and I think Heba also mentioned the piece we had out at the World Economic Forum with uh, uh, Mohit uh, Yoshi, who is a global president, one of the global presidents of Infosys, uh, global worldwide. Um, we talk there, and uh, of course, this is accessible online, you can have it, but again, we talk there on, on the duality of both um, you know, digital and physical assets and how they can work together to provide better experiences in financial services. This is one of the things we see um, as a major concern right now, especially after COVID uh, um, uh, era, where where people will have to rethink more seriously their their physical assets. And in terms of the banking space, obviously these are the branches, uh, so there needs to be a more solid uh, a thought through strategy on this particular um, issue. I know a lot of the, for a lot of the banks, this this has been a very sensitive uh, topic, and they were quite. Um, you know, hesitant to basically go in drastic cuts of, of uh, physical presence. But now I think they have very good excuse and, and they, they will have to strategize on top of that. So um, moving away from what we call kind of omnichannel strategies, perhaps to uh, what we'd like to call now digital strategies with uh, digital channels being kind of perhaps the primary channels, but also with very good um, uh, synergies with the physical assets that the banks may have or choose to push forward in the future. 
one last thing I wanted to say, and perhaps then jump into the questions, would be that, you know, both in terms of competition, in terms of the changing world right now, and in terms of digital becoming a more predominant kind of topic within uh, finance, specifically within, within banking and payments as well, uh, we have seen a lot of movement from the big tech companies coming into the finance services sector. And uh, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time, but to highlight, you know, some of the collaborations that we have seen. Of course, Amazon with WorldPay or uh, Apple with Goldman Sachs. And going forward, a lot more big tech companies will want to explore this space. Like, for example, we've heard rumors recently about Citibank being in discussions with Google, so on and so forth. Um, so all these discussions will basically move uh, the the idea of data being even more central into financial services as part of the key part of a uh, or, or keep a key asset within financial institutions that needs to be taken advantage a lot more for uh, people who participate in the value exchange to be more competitive and be able to uh, uh, to to share the market in into you know in in any domain of financial services. Um, so there's a lot more uh, to see a thing on these on this space as well from big tech companies, and um, that's why we kind of highlighted this. One of the this is probably the last um, paper that we're really focusing on the role of big tech companies within finance, and it has been really uh, interesting to see the different strategies that they're actually using to enter the market. Uh, so that's all from me. Just uh, some thoughts uh, presented, hopefully not too uh, overwhelming. Uh, as the starters, and then I think it would be very interesting to discuss some of these themes uh, in this webinar. Uh, I just this is my final slide, basically with some of the references. But feel free to reach out um, if you have, you know, kind of particular requests about any readings or any parts for resets. Um, yeah, so that's all from me. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, lots of food for thought. Um, we'll we'll come back near the end of, of the session to ask you about some of the plans because obviously you've opened up so many interesting topics, each of which could take a number of questions. But on the number of topics that you opened, both in relation to the branches specifically, but also in relation to how banks might change, I thought first I'd go to Muhammad and get some of his feedback from your experience in the region, having been helping banks with their IT infrastructure for a good 20 plus years. What resonates with you as something that you can see already happening? What do you think will take longer? And you know, how does this impact us closer to the MENA region? Okay, thank you, Amy, for the question. Actually, it's like um, a very interesting topic. Thanks a lot, Dr. Marcus, for uh, for the presentation. And I believe um, you know the whole market here. I would say Middle East and North Africa is started already um, maybe a few years back is talking about discussing about their branch you know why we have the branches and the branch is even numbered and the branch is the branch as well design and so on and then what we have watched out that uh, you know most of the banks started looking at the digital transformation be being part of replacing or you know uh, some of the branches or the design of the branches itself i was discussing like over the last few days as well to see what is the market um, how's the market here just to give you some some examples we have one of the banks has 50 plus branches over the last four years back. And then a year back, he go from 50 to 30, 30 plus. Why did this transition happen? Because of the digital and the, the technology. What people had started doing is replacing all the branches by digital, which means either even uh, I could see one of the international banks as well here, you can go to the bank, you can have the space, but you don't see people. You know, you can even have one, uh, you know, uh, meter and greeter can tell you here is the way you can use the machines, how can you take, you know, the tour and so on. So the banks started like a few years back because of the cost, because many other aspects and because really digital started maturity, digital banking, uh, many fintechs came in, uh, as, as players and all of this played a role really to tell banks why we have the space and how the branches. What's happening now more is after the COVID, you know, uh, and I've been discussing with some colleagues in the industry, uh, people within COVID, they operated with one third of their branches. Like, and this is a study with one of the banks here in the region. And they said with one third of the branches, we're able really to serve, to serve our customers. Can we continue with the same? Or maybe we'll add like not one third, it will be maybe 40 and so on. So the direction is happening here and in the region is the branches are coming uh, smaller or uh, the number is less as well as the branch design is becoming different before you go to the banks here you can go you can find a customer service 
and then you can see a very long, you know, cashier, they call it the tellers. Now this has been changing. You're going to go to the bank now, you're going to see customer service and one or two, two, two tellers. But let me tell you something very interesting. I was discussing with some people as well. They said, okay, we should really like very much. They said, okay, we become like an apple. I said, why? What, what do you mean by the apple? Says, the customer comes to us today in the branch. We don't have a customer service. We don't have a teller. We have only one. You go there, you sit with him, you do all your banking. So I think the, the model is changing. And I believe the digitization, digital transformation is helping a lot. Plus, I think COVID is playing a big role here. We're going to see, uh, you know, very soon after, after you know, the pandemic is over, you're going to think it be, be like a normal for us being digital. Thank you, Mohammed. Sorry, I saw one question. Uh, yes, there is a question box. And you guys already, we have one question on it. And there's another one from Zed asking if we can ask questions to the panel. Yes, please go ahead. If you have questions, post them in the question panel. And I've got a couple of quick questions to, got the, to get the panel started. Uh, and then I'll pass on the questions from, uh, as many questions as we can get on from the audience on the question, uh, on the question uh, um, panel there. So by all means, post your questions there. You'll find an option to post questions. Um, let, let me take you both and start from where we are going forward. And, and to some extent, we talked about branches last, but in a sense, that's what's happening almost immediately. Um, I want to ask the question in two different ways. I start with me as somebody who never really liked going to a bank branch. So what I was looking for is what do I have to go for? And ultimately ended up being depositing checks, which, and the other thing, which doesn't happen very often, would be things around KYC and AML. They want to see my original passport or they want to know who I am, somehow identify me. But if we start with that as the stuff that still requires you maybe to be physically present or sign something, and let's say eventually that can also, you can have some kind of digital identity. As we go down all the way to cash, you almost don't need to, to do that anymore. So, I mean, very brief questions, first of all, how long do you feel it'll be where you don't have to go to the bank? And then we'll, I'll ask my second question because that's coming at it from a different angle. And what are the things that are still sticky? I mean, there's no reason why checks should still require you to go to the bank. And I noticed on the last check I got, it had a little uh, barcode. I have an Emirates MBD account. It was an Emirates MBD check, but I have no option to take that picture and deposit it in the account. I don't know why. But sort of where do you think the, the, the slowest part will be and how long will it take where you don't have to go first? Um, whoever would like yeah. to start. Uh, not to yeah, I think so. that's a good point. Um, I think gradually banks are developing the capability to offer more and more services through through different channels and particularly uh, you know the digital channels for example mobile banking or internet banking uh, predominantly um and there there's still as you mentioned there's still things you can't do uh, for example in the uk you can deposit checks using the imaging process through your mobile phone and everything but but there is a limit to that as well. You know, if the if the check, for example, is beyond a particular um, figure, you actually have to go into the bank. Now, the quite the real question there is why do we still have people kind of issuing checks? Um, and and I guess that's that's a, a different uh, discussion. But you know, if you think that there's there's business processes and operations as part of of uh, uh, customers of the banks, bigger customers of the banks and corporate customers of the banks that are still using, you know, these services, then you will, you. that's why we'll see kind of a gradual phase out of these services. If something happened and these services were not offered anymore, um, uh, you know, through, for, through, through uh, corporate customers, for example, the banks to their own customers, then the banks would probably be able to accelerate the, um, um, the, the phasing out of, of these things that you can't uh, that you can't do um, through these channels and you only have to come into the branch. Um, but I think so so there are a few good points about um, you know moving things basically in the digital environment. Obviously for the banks it's been the cost, the cost structure of the services they're offering. Uh, so and I think they're feeling a lot of pressure right now from fintech companies who can actually uh, do everything online because that's the only channel that they have, right? So they have really no choice at this point because they don't really have major assets to play around with physical presence, right? Whereas the banks have this as a legacy and they're trying to move away from this. Um, 
And so, you know, the banks have this immediate pressure of trying and reducing their cost structure and, and be more competitive uh, compared to kind of fintechs who are actually also expanding their their product portfolio into, into different services in the only digital kind of uh, a model that they have. Uh, so I think it's not going to be for for a lot more years that we actually have to go to the branch. But I think there are some strategic um, things that the big banks, the common banks with a physical presence can leverage with their uh, with their presence uh, in the physical world through the branches. And that's kind of more premium services, for example, uh, or more tailored advice or things that they can leverage their expertise and skills. And uh, perhaps financial advisors they might have who can provide a more um, um, a more, you know, kind of like um, a face, a better face-to-face -face experience uh, with with their kind of more premier customers who kind of uh, uh, basically prefer to go into and see a particular person instead of consume kind of automated uh, services from a robot advisor, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I think these are the things that the banks will need to really sit down and think and strategize. And that will definitely also have an effect of how the branches are even shaped uh, right now. So which is, I think, what Mohammed kind of referred to, right? So we have seen a massive uh, uh, push from the banks to really redesign the branches we, uh, geared in a more kind of um, um, uh, digital world, let's say. But I still think there's a lot more room to go beyond that because we still don't see the digital element being embedded in these journeys that people have in the branches. For example, as you also said, you, you still have to go to the branch. You need to identify yourself using a kind of more old fashioned uh, uh, kind of identification process. You still have yeah. to have your ID, perhaps your card, put it into the machine, kind of put your pin in, et cetera, which is ridiculous to have to do in the branch while at the same time you just through your phone identify yourself to your biometric um, curve credentials, let's say, right? So these these kind of integrations can become a lot better to provide better experiences within the branch. Yeah. I need to add here as well. Uh, I mean, you know, like I think this is happening. You know, I would tell you, like for example, the central bank if you last year issued some circulars that you cannot give a check to every big check to everybody. You have to know, you know, like so you want to put some kind of uh, of limit, not limitation, they're going to find some vehicles where they said, okay, you should go more direct, direct debit, you should go more alternative digital channels. So this, I think this is happening, but this has some other elements, which means the law itself has to start changing because now for some banks and some companies, they take a check because like a security deposit or whatever they call it. So they can go to the, the, the you know, the, the court and they can issue, you know, like you can make a case or whatever. While in the other digital payment, it's still new, so you cannot deal with it the same like check. Even companies which goes today for digital, you still have to keep a check because, you know, this is the way you are able to take it and, you know, go to court and so on in case someone is defaulting. So this does not, it's only technology is one, technology is available, but regulation is there, but also you need the government infrastructure and the law need to change. That's why it's taking some, some time a little bit more, yes, but it's happening. For the uh, onboarding and KYC, let me tell you something very interesting because this is very important for all of us here in, in, the, in the region. Uh, the government, uh, you know, um, infrastructure is very important. Some countries today, and uh, I think in Saudi, uh, you had some, uh, you know, uh, announcement. You can open a, a bank account with one of the banks I worked for before. You can open a bank account without visiting the bank and you can get now in, as well uh, 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 finance without visiting the bank. Why? Because they tap into the government infrastructure to yeah. identify you as KYC. It's happening the same here. Recently, we have, uh, you know, smart UE pass and UAE, where before you have to go and visit a kiosk to be able to onboard yeah. yourself. Now you, are not, you don't need, you can do it online, which means the bank, if they use it, they know you very well. So I think the EQIC identity is the first step, really. And I can see here I have from Deloitte Digital, they have a very interesting, um, uh, you know, survey in June for the for the for the region here. And the first thing for all the banks and uh, even fintechs is the uh, EQIC is the ability to identify the customer. And I believe yeah. that adding into getting the regulation is one, innovator another one, and then the government infrastructure. If you bring all this together, then you're able to really to tap into these uh, issues and able to move forward. As soon as you have really the 
identity being identified, then everything else is easy. Thank you, guys, because you actually two things happened. Uh, Marcus answered the second question I was going to ask in relation to why would people like to go to the branch rather than have to. And, and that was a clear answer in terms of contact and some premium services. And Mohammed, you highlighted something very important uh, in that the technology infrastructure might be there, but you're also missing both the legal and sometimes the standard or the government making certain facilities. So, um, yes, my Emirates ID <coughs> is a uh, um, legally something I can use. However, if it's not set up by government in a way that allows it to have a picture taken by on a mobile phone and be sure not to be fake because of the laser sticker or whatever, there's a government infrastructure yeah. leg, and then there's the technology itself. And and I'm, I guess the answer to all of these is that's possible as and when all come together. Now, my, my little last addition to that is more of a dig, which is that the actual time it'll take might be longer because some of the legacy systems underlying everything in the banks might trip things up. And uh, we all have experiences of going to the branch and being told things that didn't make sense because of something that they stuck on. But actually, the answer is you, you, you might not have to go at all and you might want to go for any number of reasons. And that becomes a marketing issue rather than something forced yeah. on you. But it's declared you have a legal structure. You have a lot of good questions. And um, I'm going to start trying to group some of them together and ask them to you guys. Um, and, and we can go through. Um, so let me pick up one. I'll ask it and then find ones related to it. And, and that moving on to the point that you made about modular banking, uh, Marcus. And this is a question from Murad who's asking, regarding modular banking, would this slow down the whole process of banking for customers? And I'll relate that to another question because there was one that's saying, uh, with most of these startups that might be part of the unbundling, if people don't know them, the kind of confusion this leads to. This is a straight off where you used to, used to apply to get a, a landline and you knew how much you're going to pay. Now you have six mobile networks and then they keep changing tariffs every day and you don't know which one to choose. And sometimes you don't know if you're getting the best deal. So what's your take on how this unbundling sometimes what it'll call, will it slow down the experience uh, is one question. Uh, people don't know who the fintechs are, would the weakest link fail along the way? Just some thoughts on, on how, how that will be for the customer to have this unbundled manager. Absolutely, very good questions, both of them. I have to say very much to the heart of what we're looking at right now. In terms of slowing down the experience, um, you know, it's, you know, there's definitely something to say there about technology and resilience of, of these uh, uh, interfaces or protocols. We have to communicate uh, data these days between these and these new entities that are part now of the value chain. Uh, so, for example, in the open banking transformation the UK is going on right now, one of the key things and key pillars of the regulation was for banks to be able to offer these kind of APIs, but also, you know, anybody who's regulated in this space, uh, up to, to, to to comply with a particular uh, benchmark in terms of performance, right? So, because if you want to push out an API in payments, for example, you can't have the end customer kind of waiting for the data to flow, you know, from perhaps the first, the, the, the first kind of um, um, uh, layer within the value chain, which might be, I don't know, the core banking system to the second layer, which could be perhaps maybe another technology that sits on top of this around uh, AML, which then sits on a, a, a payment processor, which then sits on API aggregator, which then sits on the customer experience layer, which is the app and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, to get there and have this up and running properly, we need to ensure that all these systems will be re resilient, all these systems will have a certain um, a kind of performance, and and so that the and then the experience doesn't become troublesome for somebody to use, uh, but it becomes kind of an asset for consumers. Right, it's something that they they want to benefit from and they can benefit from. So, definitely, a very good question. I think there's one of the key debates right now is. The, the overall kind of resilience and integration of the the entire kind of open banking kind of infrastructure in the UK because this is very much at the heart of open banking. This kind of openness is where this kind of modularity really emerges from, right? And we have seen that yeah. kind of gradually developing. I will have to add something there because it's not just about slowing down. It's also what happens when one of these kind of entities uh, fails, right? Uh, or maybe it's a fraudulent entity. And there's a very good example here with Wirecard, 
right? So Wirecard in the in the in Germany recently kind of failed, and we had a few companies in the UK that the FCA had to seize operations to make sure that it protects kind of the assets that people held with these with these companies uh, and with Wirecard a uh, card. Uh, processing kind of service which was based in the in the UK and customers were indeed impacted so there's some people that couldn't withdraw the money from one of these other entities that was using Wirecard as part of the value chain to deliver the service so um, and that's that's very concerning to see and I think um, you know specifically looking at the FCA response I think they, they've handled it well so they're increasing they're upping the game in terms of of the things that um, all these uh, entities involved in this value chain will need to comply with in order to be able um, to be used by other entities to to bring about kind of the end the the end experience to the customer. So really good questions there. And I think the second question uh, was around uh, the what part of the modes like I forgot the second part of the question. Um, but it's okay. We can we can I can throw a couple in. Mohammed, what what did you have to add to that? And I, I can come yeah, back with the questions that we're not covering. Yes, the same one. See, open uh, open banking means here open the you know a banking platform for uh, innovators for fintechs, and bring a kind of competition among these guys. So I would say as well the open banking uh, you know regulation will will set who is able really to to get into the banking data and you know how can we you know aggregate between a bank and one fintech or two or more so all of this should really limit you know this kind of uh, performance uh, this question is asking plus if you have two three uh, companies giving the same services you are able to move from one to another so i believe all these fintechs will be very careful to give a bad uh, you know a bad uh, customer experience here and i think this would be good for the for the for the consumer in the beginning yes you expect anything you're going to use in the beginning you will have hiccups but I believe in the long run or uh, or mid mid run mid, mid term or mid time, it will be much better than just using a bank and then you're using the bank only. So we, what can you do? You have seven eight banks, but here you have more avenues to go in case you're gonna make able to switch easily as well. That's very very important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to follow up on what Mohammed said, because I think I remember now the second part of the question. Of course, there's an abundance of fintech um, you know services right now, and that can be confusing. And I think. That can also be something that the incumbent banks, you know, the, the tra traditional banks in different kind of markets, um, can can somehow also take advantage of and see it as an opportunity because they can really act as the aggregators of the experience and and as platforms where they can suggest and point their customers to uh, to third party services whenever they feel you know it's beneficial for them. So you know it's it's kind of like a similar approach. For example, when you have your iPhone, right? So you you can see lots of different apps, but Apple has particular uh, rules and regulations so who can actually develop third party apps for them, and they kind of curate. Uh, into a certain degree, this experience and interaction you have with these apps. So I think the banks there can really act as aggregators of the experience and, and try and curate this space in a way that is not really confusing for customers, right? Now, of course, there are several questions, both economic questions and, and ethical questions and data questions and technology questions sure. in, in that narrative, for example. Um, but yeah, as, as a broader model, I think that that can be something that banks can also take advantage and play to their strengths. Um, there are so many questions. I'm trying to group some of them. There's a number of questions in, re in the same space in relation to potential consolidation in more than one level. One is between fintechs themselves. The other is with banks ending up acquiring fintechs. So there are, there's questions in that space in terms of how this might move forward, and then collaborations with tech companies as well. So, so the, the you know from uh, a fintech to what they call tech fin, where the, where the tech giants get into finance, to to the consolidation of the small ones, to the banks acquiring them. And I know it's kind of the, there's so many of the questions that come up here. Uh, but they're worth maybe putting together. I'm not doing justice to all the people who ask them in different ways. But I wanted to leave that with you in terms of what you're seeing sort of globally and in the region uh, and what your expectations might be in, in that particular space. Mohammed, you want to take this first? Fine, yeah, yeah I'll take it. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, you know, like uh, regarding the consolidation, it might be happening. It's happening already around banking in the region. And this is okay because I think we 
uh, during the when the oil was very high in price we have many banks here so we have me in some countries we have lots of banks but on the fintech itself i think consolidation is taking some time because still it's an early stage to to really consolidate fintechs there are some fintechs who really can, are doing well they are able to tap and reach to the market and they're able to get collaboration with, with other big entities and others still in, on their own way uh, now it's very important to know that like the collaboration now let me give you a very important thing about the fintech when it started a few years back and start talking about it it was a zero-sum game i used to say fintech will replace banks uh, I, one of the investors said okay after one year you will not see banks for example some people used to say like that a blue chain and so on but now it's not a zero-sum game anymore since last year everybody knows that this, everybody has a, a, a role to play and the banks will still be there fintechs will still be there but the one really will come in with great ideas and they have are being backed by good and smart entrepreneurs plus even uh, investors will be able to tap into this one and the collaboration mood is the best right now and everybody i think knows about this it's not like it will not go really and say okay we'll 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 we'll, we'll get con uh, fintechs together maybe uh, after a few years you will find some fintechs coming together and then becoming a big fintech or some big uh, come fintech is asking a sm smaller one this might be happening soon and uh, maybe in the west it's happening but in our region no because i have uh, around 300 plus fintechs today in, in the region it still is five six years old or seven years old uh, industry for us so i think the consolidation here will not happen very fast there is a very important thing here that the ability to get funds the ability to get the trust of uh, consumer and banks and I believe banks start playing a very good role here. Some good banks, the big banks, they open their own API, they open their even system. They brought in the fintechs even before the, there's an open uh, uh, API uh, rules here or regulation. And they start working with them because you could see there is a value here. So I believe the collaboration mode is happening. Consolidation in fintechs is, is taking time. It's not happening now. You won't see it in our two, three years. While the bank consolidation is happening, and I think this is helping, I think fintechs especially, you know, the, the one that is really uh, doing something unique. Because you can see now we have, just to let you know, 84% of fintechs in the region are in payments and remittances. So now this is very important here. There is other areas which is really are being developed. We can talk many things about that, but just for the time, I can, can see other questions. Okay, I have so many good questions. People are asking about everything from things like um, government infrastructure facilitating KYC and AML as centralized that can be a service to all sorts of other things. But I'm going to target what I think would be like three broad areas in the remaining 12 minutes. I know Marcus, you, you, you have to finish it in an hour and I think maybe I can continue with Mohammed for a few more minutes, uh, but we understand that you have other commitments. Um, the questions are coming about the impact on many levels on banking as is of some of the new developments um, and i'll just read three questions not the entire question so one was in terms of the impact on wealth management and private banking in particular we kind of touched upon that with premium services uh, the other was with a potentially it's more related to what you mentioned about central bank digital currencies it's essentially how does that impact the credit system if you are, if, if the central bank digital currency implemented in a way where you have an account at the central bank, not through a deposit in the bank, where do they get their access to funds? That, that's something that comes up as a potential, but also in related to that, um, cash, uh, it's still for older people and others, it's something that's critical and unique. Does it risk disappearing too quickly? Um, so just the impact across various sectors of banking on some of the newer developments, in relation to kind of the underlying assets. So I think you mentioned in your presentation, peer-to-peer -peer in relation to central bank digital currency, that essentially is intermediated by the central bank. They hold the account, um, unlike some, some other digital currencies. So just kind of across uh, whether it's impact on credit, uh, on investments maybe to some extent, but also in relation to things like wealth management, um, your your views potentially on the disruptions that might come in that space and what's been exaggerated, as Mohammed was saying, banks will disappear was the word. Now we're kind of seeing something more subtle. Uh, what do you take on, on sector, specific sectors, perhaps credit uh, and, and wealth, wealth management? The, the key that came up. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of interesting developments and, and technology really 
basically disrupts different parts of financial services in, in different ways. Um, I mean, we've discussed uh, quite a bit banking so far. Uh, and of course, you know, there's different narratives there, but I think wealth management, uh, there has been uh, a similar but also different trajectory. So we have seen a lot of independent fintechs really thriving into this space. Um, you know, the so-called kind of robo-advisors and they, a lot of them have gained uh, quite a bit of popularity because they democratize basically access to these kind of services that were quite uh, difficult to get into before through the banks uh, because of both requirements but also um, in terms of um, you know fees and so on and so forth um, so we have seen um, yeah the emergence of some of the robot advisors and we have seen actually that some of the banks and bigger players have have also tried to create their own robot advisors some of them in a successful way some in that some of them in a less successful way uh, also we have seen as part of the uh, broader kind of bank and fintech collaboration kind of ecosystem we have seen some interesting collaborations between banks and robot advisors so as a you know robot advisors kind of like a suggested um you know service that consumers can um, um uh, you know, or, or, or banks customers can consume through the uh, integration that the bank can provide with these services. Um, I mean, you know, certainly, certainly a lot more to see, I think, in this space, considering also on the, you know, overall kind of investment opportunities that one might have. So the the peer-to-peer -peer architecture you mentioned before that also applies uh, in lending, but also in terms of investment. So you have, uh, Peer to peer platforms where you know obviously as a lend, as a um, as somebody who needs access to money you can you can uh, get loans but also uh, you know investors are able to uh, to channel you know assets and cash into these systems and platforms and recently we've seen even banks collaborating with some of these kind of bigger lenders to provide cash into these platforms um, so that they can they can benefit by the more advanced way uh, on how these platforms kind of assess risk uh, so so these are kind of a few developments I think you know, that are happening in both wealth management and investment kind of parts of fintech. Now, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, trends around, I think you mentioned CBDCs and the more kind of distributed setup that I also described in my presentation. I think there's, you know, there's certainly um, uh, a, a push to, to, uh, to use kind of more, um, first of all, there's a push that the entire architecture of the finance system becomes more modular, but also more distributed overall. So this is an observation we've made across across finance services. But I think specifically in payments, when we think about the transfer of, val of value, right? So blockchain can really facilitate a lot more these kind of peer-to-peer -peer interactions or distributed ledger-based technologies can facilitate uh, a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And CBDCs definitely uh, can be a quite drastic way to deploy such technology in the context of payments now the key thing there is like you think it's a bdc and you're saying okay so i'll have an account with a central bank the thing there is that i don't think there's a central bank that can actually they can provide access to central bank reserves through this system but they they're not going to be willing to service this account right so there's not the central bank is not going to be the entity that you know if something happens you will call to get information or or to get uh, a service from them right so you'd still need some kind of intermediary that will you know be in the middle either to provide infrastructure but also service this account and this could be in that scenario could be again banks of course in that sense they're they're um their role is going to be different, so they're not going to be providing access to the bank reserves anymore themselves, right? So because that can happen directly with the accounts, but the servicing of the accounts can happen through them. For example, even the fact that you may be holding a wallet yourself, uh, that could be serviced by commercial bank, right? Now the implication there, of course, is on, on um, you know the functionality of commercial bank as, as deposit institutions and then lenders i think that certainly that is you know very much at the heart of these discussions right now so we don't know how it's going to be uh implemented we don't know what the character of cbdc is going to be we don't have a, a real uh case of cbdc kind of going forward yet to see how that could take place in action so all these kind of questions are still to be uh, answered i think which adds to a question that was asked in relation to traditional banks margins and all these things 
because obviously a yeah. big part of that comes from the ability to use the deposits for lending, but also there is it's coming under attack from potentially central bank digital currencies, we don't know, but also with all the competition in terms of their margins, which are reasonably comfortable at the moment. That, that's another threat, and, and yeah, that was absolutely. one of the questions that was raised. Absolutely, but you have to also think that people will in businesses, right, in the global economy will still need to to uh, to um, to to basically borrow money, right? So they will still need access to capital. Uh, so this this is something that even if I deposit my cash to the central bank, uh, I don't think that the central bank would all, also become a lender, right? So this very cash might be somehow be distributed or or you know uh, utilize these kind of reserves to lend to banks so they can lend into the real economy. So again, you're going to have the distinction kind of between. The cash, when it starts becoming a distinction, a bank deposit and a deposit uh, of reserves are actually legally somewhat qualitatively different. But uh, Muhammad, I want to come on to you, but uh, I wanted to ask one quick question because there's so many questions that we've, we've, we are unable to ask. Uh, Marcus, I wanted to ask you very briefly. I know University of Manchester has got plans to do some courses online in the fintech space. Maybe there's not much you can share with us now. I know there is a, a program in place to develop stuff. What can you share with us briefly? Because I know a number of people on this call would be interested to know what we're going to offer because they've seen offerings from other universities. Yeah, of course. Uh, more than happy to share a few things. I mean, we are designing right now uh, an online uh, executive education program aimed at people who want to become more familiar uh, with the space of fintech and also um, uh, the, the nitty-gritty kind of all the mechanisms and the economic phenomena behind it. So this, I think, definitely there's there's a lot more offerings even globally. But you know, a, a lot of you will probably be aware of some uh, uh, re really kind of um, uh, early perhaps examples of online education on fintech. I think a lot of them were covering kind of the very basics because they were launched uh, at a stage where a lot of people were not really familiar with fintech uh, per se. So these were more introductory or they're focusing more on the entrepreneurship side. Uh, what we're trying to do is to basically collect a lot of the material from research that we have done across uh, the industry um, and also academic research looking at the economic phenomena and decisions and, and strategies behind these uh, decisions like uh, financial institutions can make. And 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 kind of offer a more kind of uh, advanced, let's say, fintech uh, course, where it's aimed more at the um, at the economics and the strategy of fintech rather than a very kind of one to one in uh, one on one introduction to fintech okay. uh, as an industry. So that's what we've it's been working know. on. And, yeah. So, thank you for that. For and I will I will ask uh, Hiba if it's okay that when Marcus has to go, he he can. But I want to direct the question at Mohammed. Thank you, yeah, by the way, very much for your time. We, yeah. we appreciate thank it. Thank you so Great. much, Professor Marcus, thank for you. being here today. I'm sure that the audience really enjoyed it. And we look forward to have to hosting you, hosting an event in November, hopefully. So stay tuned to that. Absolutely. We'll keep yes. you posted with, with the dates and final details. Uh, thank you. And we'll Thanks continue. a lot. Great thank to talk so to everyone. Much. Thanks. I mean, for thanks, Mohammed. Thank you. Hey, but can we continue for a few minutes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Mohammed, I wanted to ask you because we mentioned that, and again, with reference to the region. I still need to understand better, and I'm hoping you can help me. What's been happening with this currency for cross-border payment called Aber, and what's different about it, and yeah, what will it yeah. mean for us? Yes, uh, you know, Aber with uh, like the digital currency between uh, UAE and Saudi. Uh, you know, the project was launched as you know like to be studied. So, which is only for uh, for settlement between UAE banks and Saudi banks. It's not really for uh, in, not for customers. So the settlement can happen between the banks in Saudi and bank, uh, bank in UAE and bank in Saudi through the digital currency to so make it faster and easier than, than going through a correspondent bank as the normal traditional way. What I get to know is it was in different phases. The first, first phase, as per the team uh, which is I contacted them, uh, the, the technical feasibility will be done, and after that they're going to see the functional or the business feasibility. Then they can you know go for it. Uh, I believe the technical feasibility was already done, and I believe we're waiting for the report to be to be published and see what is the next step. But uh, this one is like I think it will be the first uh, of its kind here in the region. And as soon as this is like as you can see the feasibility from technical point of view and the functional point of view, then I believe other GCC countries will be part of it, 
and I believe this is in the Arab Monetary Fund or some other uh, organization for the Arab countries here as well for working something similar with the same team. So hopefully this will see it soon. And we're waiting for the first part of the report for the technical visibility. Okay, thanks, Mohammed. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, some people have started going because obviously you've got to the end. There were a couple of good, quite yes. good questions, but some people who asked questions have, have moved on. But um, there, there was one that I noticed from Jan uh, asking, since checks are so useful and neither direct debits nor wires replace them, well, why not just, why don't banks just digitize checks? And I think there is, um, I I'm just want to go back to your point, Mohammed. I think it's interesting that you highlighted, you, in theory, the check's just a payment method. What you highlighted is when we use post-dated checks in the UAE, it's a form of credit. And people, yes. in fact, discount them. Uh, they can be digitized, but, I mean, the minute you deposit them, they're actually in cash. So in answer yes. to Jan's question, in the in the use case of using checks as a way of borrowing or, or sort of guaranteeing payment in future, they will yes. take more to, it's doable, I'm sure, but they're harder to digitize than simply just taking a picture of the barcode, it's deposited yes. and it's done. So I think, uh, Mohammed, you kind of answered that question yes. uh, before because you are highlighting the difference. The check can have more than one use. And actually, in, in this part of the world, we use it as a way of making a forward payment, which, which might require special programming, if you like. Um, yeah. That was an interesting one as well. Um, I pick one more. I, I can see people are going to want to uh, start going. But um, there was one in particular, which I saw. Let me just get back to that. Um, and this is one, uh, and that's from Wayne, and, and this is from Wayne, because you're all familiar with this case. To what extent and when my banks in Nina start using blockchain technology to allow external verification, e.g. audit confirmations? Um, Can you repeat again, uh, I mean, because... So uh, to, to, to what extent and when might banks in Mina region start using blockchain to allow external verification? Uh, so, okay. for example, for audit confirmations. Yes, see, I mean, let us, you know, talk about blockchain. Blockchain, I think we are reaching to a level of, you know, starting to see some, you know, uh, hanging fruits of blockchain. Uh, it has been there for a while. There are some mini BOCs happening. There are some interesting BOCs happening or projects happening between UE banks. So people can get a letter and they don't have to go and ask the bank for something. It can be in the blockchain. There is some other interesting stuff happening here. Uh, the, the cross border, the only use case have, they have been trying is was only the cross border payment or money transfer, and okay. the Rebel also doing a good, good job here from a platform. But I would say a blockchain wait for maybe 22, 23 till you see a matured blockchain environment where banks can start to really utilizing, which is okay. even with external parties. But for internal, I think maybe by next year we'll see something. Uh, this year there is some you know work was happening already between some uh, uh, ue banks but i believe this one I, as i said it's taking time and we will move, move from the high blockchain to reality and i believe now that the real use cases will you will see it soon ue as a, as a country as well you know and dubai as well we have some blockchain uh, big use cases will happen by next year and this also will help banks to to tap into this so, but I would say it's still a little bit early. I think by 23, maybe we'll see, uh, you know, some really mature blockchain in banking here in Europe. Um, I, I'm going to end on, on one somebody asked and just uh, somebody was asking it again. It, I think I saw the question twice. It, it makes perfect sense to have some kind of digital KYC and standardize it. I, I personally think uh, that's probably, this is a part of the, of the world which makes sense to do that. I'm just speaking as somebody who's involved in investments. The number of times we had clients send us paper copies of their passport signed in wet ink and witnessed is bizarre to me. It's in this day and age. And um, they would have had to do that for every investment they made somewhere. So really, maybe having something centralized, which allows people to pass some kind of token on blockchain to say, according to this agreed standard run by the governments of the GCC or whoever, we can verify their identity and, and uh, we can allow this particular financial service provider to look at the records or whatever. It, it, it would be great, but I think it will take... I think this is very valid even for the fintech what's happening today because part of the important points here, we have many fintechs have, uh, working in the all the GCC and North Africa, but now if you want to do some work here, you want to go somewhere else, you have to start a little bit from, not from yeah. scratch, you have to repeat again the harmonization between the centers 
as we as we as the government is very important here. But at least let us say if we're going to have the, the digital QIC here internally, and we have somewhere else, and then we can link this together, like what we have done before. You remember in the US switch and the switches for the money switches yes. for the for money. Then I think we'll reach to this one. So we need to reach the maturity on a country level and try yeah. to bring this together. And I believe blockchain is playing a big role here. Uh, and for, for what you mentioned uh, as well, uh, I mean, we have even the QIC about the government that hopefully by after the use cases happen, that you will not really need to carry your passport anytime. It will be there, you know, you go to any government organization, no passport, no uh, driving license, all will be there in the blockchain. Hopefully, I we're almost there end. with Emirates ID now. I mean, that's Emirates all they asked for, but, but then it can be biometric. Now, yeah. I think we are moving into this, but let us do it on a country level, and I believe this will happen later on uh, cross borders. Okay, we've got fewer people left than that with, that were with us with, uh, before. I will go back and recommend if people are interested in the topic, there are lots of interesting resources online, and I know that we are planning to do something in Manchester that's a bit more advanced but it's good to disambiguate. There's so many key issues here. One is digital identity. You want to avoid a lot of going to branches. So how do you sign? Where does blockchain come into that? That's one aspect. The other is actually in terms of just making everything faster. Banking, unlike, for example, um, a simple transaction requires so much verification. You don't want your identity to be stolen because it identifies your assets and all sorts of other factors. So the infrastructure we've been discussing today is very relevant compared to other e-commerce. You know, if you order some food online and they don't collect payment, it's not the same as somebody having access to your bank account, although that's, that's a relevant part. But also there are deeper issues in relation to how banks work. At the moment we park our money in banks in return for them allowing us to pay each other and to make payment processing, but they can lend that money. The whole co point about central bank digital currencies is that you're not keeping your money with a bank anymore. You're kind of keeping it somewhere else. How do banks then go and do lending? So there are a number of issues we covered and uh, it's probably worthwhile if somebody's interested, because this will impact uh, every business in so many ways, to try to get an overview. It will be, it will be worthwhile looking at one of these fintech courses. But um, I think we're well over time. So I think, Heba, I'll pass back to you um, before, um, before we conclude. Thank you, Amin. Um, I just want to say thank you, uh, Amin. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, this was really a very interesting chat. I, I'm looking at the questions, and we have um, a huge amount of questions. I know that we weren't able to go through them. But anyway, if the audience would like to reach out to our speakers, you can do straight away through LinkedIn, or you could email me. Uh, they're available to, um, to answer these questions. And, and if you're uh, in town and you come to one of the events, I, I wouldn't like to write a long answer to any of these questions, but I'm happy to answer them face-to-face <laughs> uh, -face or on a call verbally. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. Yes, feel free to reach out and stay tuned to our events, which are all posted on our website. Uh, so make sure to go to, to www.manchester.ac.ae. We have an event tomorrow, a webinar uh, on entrepreneurship. So if you're interested, please log in to the university website and register to attend the event and also to to, um, to see other events which are taking place this week and next week. Thank you all again. Thank you to our speakers. Um, I really, really appreciate your input and your insights today. And we look forward to hosting you again, hopefully face-to-face um, -face in the future, very near future. Uh, so with this, I would like to um, wish you all a very good evening. And I thank you all. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank Thanks, Mohammed. Thank Thanks, Amin. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.